Okay, let's talk about anatomy, uh, cardiovascular anatomy. So cardiovascular anatomy, we have heart anatomy. Uh, what do we have here? So left atrium is the most posterior part of the heart, high yield. Left atrium, most posterior part of the heart. Enlargement of the left atrium, w w example in mitral stenosis, can lead to compression of the esophagus, dysphagia, and or left recurrential nerve, uh, uh, branch of the vagina causing hoarseness, which is known as Ortner syndrome. So looking back here, what are we trying to say? We are saying left atrium right here, right? It's the most posterior. So this is all anterior. This is all posterior. So what is most posterior of the heart? Left atrium right here is the most posterior. So what is the most anterior part of the heart, which is going to be written here? It is your left ventricle, uh, right ventricle, my bad, right ventricle. So if you were to enlarge the left atrium, for example, in myrostenosis, it can lead to compression of esophagus. Where is the esophagus? Right here between, between your left atrium and aorta, you have esophagus, a black tube. Let me zoom in, try to tell you here. So this is going to be your esophagus. Or hypothetically, you can think, okay, it's the esophagus behind that, okay? But it, it, the esophagus is there. Uh, anatomically, either it's going to be here or right here, okay? Uh, but it's going to be behind this left atrium for sure. So that esophagus. So you, if you increase, if you increase the size of this left atrium, you're gonna, you, you're gonna uh, constrict. You, you're going to compress the esophagus. That's one thing. On top of that, you could mess up your left recurrent lingual nerve, which can give you hoarseness, which is known as Ortner syndrome. With that Ortner syndrome, you c the patient can develop, uh, can have. Uh, they can have chronic cough, so hoarseness and chronic cough, right? Uh, cr chronic cough, hoarseness, and dysphagia when you obstruct the esophagus, and that would be called as cardiogenic dysphagia, cardiogenic dysphagia, because of esophagus is blocked up, or or hoarseness syndrome. Um, I mean hoarseness, um, hoarseness, which is Ortner syndrome. Okay, now the other other way, other thing is, uh, let me change color, right ventricle. So the right ventricle is the most anterior part of the heart and the most commonly injured at the trauma. For example, somebody gets a trauma, a knife penetrating injury from straight to the anterior part of the heart, or thora uh, thorax, what is going to happen? You're going to damage that right ventricle. When you damage that right ventricle, uh, you, that's the most common part which gets injured in trauma, high yield. So left ventricle, r this one, left ventricle, let me change color, left ventricle, uh, left ventricle is about two third, uh, two third, and the right ventricle is about one third of the inferior diaphragmatic cardiac surface, um, as mentioned in picture this one on the right side. So what do we have? Look at this right ventricle. This is about one third, while look at the left ventricle is about two third of the. Uh, it is about two thirds for the uh, uh, of the uh, diaphragmatic cardiac structures. So this is all about heart anatomy. Now we're looking at the pericardium. What is pericardium? Changing color. Pericardium. It consists of three three layers. Okay. What do we have? Three layers from in from outer to inner. Okay. Uh, from outer to inner, what do we have? So first of all, we have, so we, normally we have pericardium. What do we have after that? We have myocardium. And after myocardium, we have endocardium, right? Uh, so we are talking about specifically epicardium at the moment. Epo epicardium has a fibrous epicardium and a parietal epicardium. And between the parietal is the uh between the parietal and the visceral pericardium, which is also known as epicardium, is going to be a space that is called 
pericardial space. Okay, pericardial space. So we have a pericardial space, a visceral layer of, uh, so, and the last one is the epicardium, which is the visceral layer. So what are we talking about? We talked about how, so we have the first is the fibr fibrinous pericardium. Then you have the parietal pericardium. After that, you have the per, uh, pericardial space and then the epicardium, which is known as the visceral uh, pericardium. Visceral means it is attached with the heart right so you can't really differentiate it above you have some space and above that you have two layers on top of it okay um, and it, it is denoted right here you have the fibr fibr fibrous pericardium and the parietal pericardium and then you have the peri pericardial space and the epicardium which is also uh, visceral also known as visceral pericardium uh, which is attached to the heart now where are the coronary vessels the coronary vessels are going to be in the uh, coronary vessels are where they if you look here they are within your epicardium okay they are within the epicardium epicardium contains the vessel important thing coronary vessels are in the epicardium okay um, yeah so we have a pe we we talked about how, all how the vessels are. So again, uh, let's just recall this thing and then move on to the next one. What do we have? Again, same thing, sa but the important thing is in the epicardium we have the blood vessels, and here is the space. Now this pericardial space lies between the parietal and pericardial uh, pericardium and epicardium. We talked about it. Pericardium is very high yield, is an innervative aphrenic nerve. Uh, pericarditis, which is inflammation of the pericardium, can cause referred pain to the neck, and arms or one or both shoulders often left so this is the phrenic nerve if it can, the, uh, uh, if you recall the phrenic nerve the roots, the roots are c3 to c5 and uh, and they the phrenic nerve not only innervates the pericardium but also the peritoneum so if you have uh, peritoneal uh, inflammation peritonitis you will also mess up this uh, it will irritate the phrenic nerve will also give you a pain that is going to go to the shoulder to the neck uh, similar right now very high yield is this coronary blood supply uh, what is the coronary blood supply uh, where you have uh, let's actually draw it here um, you have uh, you have aorta uh, right that aorta gives rise to ascending aorta gives rise to LCA which is left uh, coronary artery and RCA right coronary artery for LCA give rise to LCX three things LCX left circumflex artery uh, and also gives rise to LAD which is left anterior descending artery and the last one which is OMA um, the marginal artery RCA gives rise to your uh, uh, your PDA and the last one it gives rise to is uh, AMA acute marginal artery now the PDA is the dominance right uh, and we will read that uh, e either it could arise from the RCA or it could either arise from LCX depending upon dominance so let's read that dominance first so dominance says you if you have a right dominant circulation which is the most common then the PDA arises with the right so most imp most commonly it arises from right here the right side that's that's the right dominant but if you have a left dominant it's gonna rise from LCX which is right there All right uh, but if you have a co-dominant circulation, PDA actually arises from both, meaning, uh, meaning the blood, both of them are joining together to form a PDA, uh, both meaning LCX and RCA. Coronary blood flow to the left ventricle or an interventricular septum high yield. Coronary blood flow to left ventricle and interventricular septum peaks in early diastole peaks in early diastole and what is that about so if you recall y you have a heart right and this heart it needs oxygen it needs oxygen when it's contracting it's it it, it is such a forceful contraction that there is no blood that it can take 
in the contraction time. So in the systole, there, uh, there is going to be no blood that the heart is taking. It's only in the diastole when the heart is relaxed and is just filling the blood. At that time, the, um, the myocytes, the cardiomyocytes are going to take up the oxygen. So same thing. So coronary blood supply, that, that's what they're trying to say here. Coronary blood supply to left ventricle peaks in early diastole because there is no contraction at that time. It's just uh, dilation. Coronary sinus runs in the left atrial groove, high yield. Where does the coronary sinus runs? Left atrial groove and drains into the right atrium. Right atrium. Uh, where does the coronary artery drain? Right atrium, high yield. Mo uh, another thing which is not mentioned here is going to be it is the most deoxygenated, it is the most deoxygenated blood of the body. Uh, uh, most deoxygenated blood is present in the coronary sinus. Now the versus, where is the most oxygenated blood? Most O2 is present where? It is going to be in the aorta, ascending aorta. It has the most uh, oxygenated uh, blood and most deoxygenated is in, in the coronary sinus. Okay, now looking at each uh, one of these things, let's change the color here quick. Okay, so we are talking about LAD. Let's erase this as well, I guess. Okay, LAD, le uh, uh, left anterior descending artery, and its branches supply anterior two third of the interventricular septum and anterior lateral papillary papillary muscle and an anterior surface of the left ventricle, high yield. And I will uh, make an image out of it. Uh, let's actually do it while we read, because that's going to be easy. So let's just make an image. So we have, we have, uh, we have right ventricle here and a left ventricle here. So lad, let's give it a color blue. Let's say, so lad is giving rise to what? Lad and its branches, which is left anterior descending in its branches, they supply the anterior two third of the interventricular septum. They supply anterior two third of the interventricular septum, which is right here. Two third of the anterior, uh, 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 meaning anterior, uh, uh, interventricular septum, meaning oh, two third of the anterior, anterior part of the interventricular septum, right? And it also supplies to the anterior wall of the anterior wall of the left ventricle. So two-third of the interventricular septum and also supplies to the anterior lateral. So I'm just going to write AL. AL of the papillary muscle and anterior surface of the left ventricle. Right? So this is about LAD. Now changing color, what about PDA? PDA supplies posterior one-third of the interventricular septum, posterior two-third of the walls of the ventricle, and the posterior medial PM of the papillary muscle. So this posterior part of the interventricular septum and posterior wall of the two-third of the uh, posterior wall of the left ventricle. So this is all PDA. Now changing color, let's look at this. What is RCA doing? RCA supplies the AV node, the SA node, Infarct may cause nodal dysfunction, bradycardia, heart block. Right acute marginality supplies the right ventricle. So they are saying all of this right ventricle, it is supplied by RCA branch, uh, either RCA or the branch of RCA, which is going to be your right marginal artery or uh, right marginal artery or acute marginal artery AMA is mentioned over there, right? Uh, so here's these now now you recall hey something is left here right what about LCX hmm, they haven't mentioned here LCX okay okay let's just talk about LCX I don't know why they haven't mentioned LCX here but let's look at LCX 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 would supply the lateral wall of the um, the lateral wall of the left ventricle and the posterior one third of the lateral ventricle and also it's going to supply to the uh, to the anterior lateral papillary muscle which is right here okay uh, so 
so this is sort of a blood supply of heart so uh, coronary blood supply so let's just recall the whole thing what is the coronary blood supply well the coronary blood supply is as follows you have you have this uh, lad uh, lad would supply wait color changed lad lad supplies the in uh, lad would supply the uh, in uh, one two third of the interventricular septum anteriorly and also the interior wall of the interior wall of the uh, uh, of the left ventricle this is left ventricle remember so anterior wall of left ventricle and one-third of uh, two-third of the anterior ventricular septum PDA supplies the posterior one-third of the interventricular septum and then also posterior part of the uh, uh, posterior two-third of the ventricular uh, uh, left ventricular wall LCX supplies the lateral wall of the left ventricle and also one-third of the posterior uh, wall of left ventricle rca is easy supplies all of the right ventricle and on top of that it also supplies the uh, sa node and av node and if you if you were to mess up your rca now let's talk about some uh, some messing up right like uh, if you have ischemia if you have ischemia to rca you have we will give it it's going to cause ischemia to the right ventricle on top of that the sa node and av node won't work so you're going to go into br uh, bradycardia and heart block right and uh and yeah and oh yeah important one lcx supplies the anterior lateral anterior lateral part of the papillary muscle and also it is also supplied by la lad so lad and lcx they both supply the anterior lateral why is that important that is important because the posterior medial is only supplied by pda the posterior medial wall of the papillary muscle is only supplied by PDA. So when you have, when you knock out your PDA, meaning when you there is an ischemia, there is an MI causing infarction to the PDA, you are going to infarct the posterior medial papillary muscle, and it's going to give you mitral regurgitation, mitral regurgitation because there is only one supply to the posterior medial papillary muscle, while there is a dual supply to anterior lateral. Why that is important? Because even if you knock out your LD, LAD, you will still not knock out your uh, anterior lateral papillary muscle, causing this. Uh, uh, you will not knock out your anterior anterior la uh, lateral papillary muscle, so there will be no MR mitral regurg. Okay, so that's pretty much all for coronary blood supply.